Will you please join me in this morning's call to worship? We gather this morning to find joy and comfort in one another, to bear each other's burdens and celebrate the mystery of life. Come, let us worship together. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be together again. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary, remotely via Zoom, watching this recording later, it is good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge and continue to reaffirm the relationship between people who are worshiping online and those who are here in the sanctuary. We call this connection to opportunity, greeting our virtual neighbors, First, we will project an image of everybody who's on Zoom up here. And I ask you to turn your cameras on and give us a wave. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. And then those of us who are here in the sanctuary, I'll invite you to turn around and give a wave to the camera. Good morning. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC at home, on campus, in the world, every day, we are Birmingham Unitarian Church and we are building the beloved community. We join with other Unitarian Universalists around the world this morning as we light our chalice. We light this chalice as a symbol of our commitment to building relationships with people of goodwill as a testament to the power of diversity of thought and in hope of a world built on a foundation of mutual concern, not mutual belief. Please uh, stand as you're willing and able and join me in singing our first hymn, The Immortal Love. Lord. 
So today's service is going to be a little different than usual because it's summer and that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> do things that are a little different. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to introduce one of my good friends, Pastor Chris Hallam, the minister of Northminster Presbyterian Church. Hey, everyone. <laughs> uh, as, as Pastor Chris and I have been getting to know each other over the last year or so, we've had a lot of conversations about what's going on in our congregations because ministers are always working all the time. <laughs> Hi, Reverend Julie Brock. <laughs> Always, always. Uh, so, you know, maybe we were supposed to be having lunch to not talk about church, but we definitely talked about church because that's just <laughs> the way it is. You know, North Mr. Presbyterian Church in Troy and Birmingham Unitarian Church here in Bloomfield Hills have a lot of things in common because we're a church <laughs> in 2023. <laughs> and it's a, it's, a time, it's, a, it's a time to be a church in 2023. So today we're going to share with you some of our conversations and uh, last week we met to talk about what we were going to do and we realized we had about four questions that we wanted to ask each other and, and talk about today. Uh, and in the run-up to it, I, I was reminded why Pastor Chris is one of my good friends because she sent me this meme that she made. So, <laughs> so here we have two very important men in the lives of people of certain generations. Uh, we have Fred Rogers, uh, who is playing the role of Northminster Presbyterian Church. Uh, Fred Rogers was, of course, an ordained Presbyterian minister. And Bill Nye, who spent a lot of time telling people he was a man of science, uh, representing Birmingham Unitarian Church. Uh, but both men, from different perspectives, taught generations of children what it meant to be caring, responsible citizens, and what it meant to lead with values from different perspectives. So here we are this morning. I hope that we're able to bring a little bit of this fun neighborly energy to the conversation. Thank you. But before that, the mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way that we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support new organizations throughout the year. The recipient for our plate sharing from July 16th through August 20th is the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. Progress has been made in Michigan with the passage of universal background checks, safe storage laws, and red flag laws, but there's much more to do. The Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence continues to work on evidence-based policies and community education to support, in support of further actions to address the epidemic of gun violence in our state and nationally. In 2018, our congregation passed a resolution affirming the need for changes in laws and society to address this issue. And our support of the coalition's work is in keeping with this resolution. Every dollar of support can help save lives. So let there be an offering of support for our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Thank you. 
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation, and we dedicate ourselves to its service. We've come to the time in our service that we set aside for spiritual practices, like centering and prayer. This morning we have a joy from Cindy Goldman that today is, is Janet Brown's birthday? Janet? <laughs> Cindy says, thanks for all you do for BUC, and I will second and third that. Thank you for everything that you do for our congregation. This morning, we also have sorrows. Carol Lee has let us know that Fred Strakey died on July 9th. Fred was a BUC member from 1981 until he moved to Chicago a couple of years ago to be near family. Fred was very involved in BUC over the years. He worked on the buildings and grounds team, many social justice causes. He also led the BUC biking group and enjoyed the Nordstrom's lunch group. And a Fred will be missed by, by many of us. I also have a sorrow submitted from Art Hillman that reaches into our larger association. Art has let us know that the Reverend Rod Solano Kesnell was killed in a vehicular accident on the 401. Reverend Rod was the called minister at the Church of Olinda in Southwest Ontario at the death of Reverend Christine Hillman eight, eight years ago. Art continues, deepest sorrow for Sarah Kathleen and the members of Olinda. I will also share that Art is with the congregation in Olinda this morning providing support. I invite you now to move further with me into a spirit of prayer. Spirit of love and life, mystery known by many names and no name at all. This morning, we gather in a time of confusion, in a time of anxiety, a time of trouble. There are losses in our congregation, in our association, and in the world. We are here under an air quality warning again. We know that the challenges that face us as individuals, as a community, as a species are great and mighty. And yet, we know that we are not called to despair. In our times of sorrow, may we find comfort in one another. When we feel challenged, may we take that as an opportunity for growth. When we feel discomfort, may we breathe deeply and find ease there that we did not expect. What we face, we do not face alone. We face together. Let us invite each other into our lives to share those struggles and to share those chilies. There are always thorns among the roses, but there are always roses among the thorns. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. We'll spend time now together in silence with our own thoughts.
just love it when human stuff happens in a service. It just feels so good. This morning's reading is from Maya Angelou. It is titled Alone. This is from Oh Pray My Wings Are Gonna Fit Me Well, which was published in 1975. Lying, thinking last night how to find my soul a home where water is not thirsty and bread loaf is not stone, I came up with one thing, and I don't believe I'm wrong, that nobody, no, nobody can make it out here alone. Alone? All alone? Nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. There are some millionaires with money they can't use. Their housewives, their wives run around like banshees. Their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone. But nobody, no, nobody can make it out here alone. Alone? All alone? Nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. Storm clouds are gathering. The wind is going to blow. The race of man is suffering, and I can hear the moan. Because nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. Alone? All alone? Nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. Is getting yours to work? Yes. Every every time I have to use it, I'm like, hello? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Must have missed that day in divinity school. <sighs> well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, Chris, this is awkward. Um, so I decided to call this two ministers walk into a church because <laughs> I wanted to be a little sassy but not too sassy. So, <laughs> so two ministers walk into a church. Um, and so like I said earlier, we sort of coalesced around four discussion prompts that we wanted to uh, to, to to discuss. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing I don't have to talk for my job. Um, I think you should start because I've talked a lot. I've had a lot of air time. Okay. So I'm asking you and then you're going to answer. Okay. I, I, I think I'm ready. I yeah. think you can do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. What misconceptions about your religious tradition? Can you please apologize for John Calvin killing Michael Cervatus? <laughs> so the first thing I will say is Yes, I, I, if I can speak for John Calvin, I am sorry. <laughs> this question came about because Mandy pesters me about this all the time, but the reality is we don't like him either. Michael Cervantes or John Calvin? John Calvin! <laughs> so, uh, clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we don't, um, so this is something that I find fascinating because there's a lot of different 
Christian denominations that center on like one theologian in particular. I mean, you have the, the Lutherans, very much like Martin Luther. They're named after it. You have the Methodist Church, which very much loves John Wesley, and you have a lot of Wesleyan thought, and you even have traditions. I mean, like the Catholic tradition very much follows the papacy and kind of the, the teachings that come down from on high. The Presbyterian tradition doesn't have one of those people. We have no central theologian. There is no one person that the tradition comes from. Yes, it evolved out of John Calvin's tradition, but we dropped him in the dust a while ago. <laughs> and to prove this, I brought, I brought one thing for show and tell. Yeah, I, I, did, I did stick it in, in the chair. Um, so one of the things that the Presbyterian Church centers on, we have two books that make up our Constitution, and one of them is the Book of Confessions. This isn't a book of everything we've done wrong. This is a book <laughs> of things that we confess to be true. And you can, this is my study edition. You can see it's quite large. John Calvin isn't in here. We have uh, statements of belief that go back to the very early church in the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. So like, this is really old, it, parts of it. Some of it's newer. Uh, parts that I love are like the um, Barman Declaration, which was written by Christians in Nazi Germany to basically say Christian nationalism is bad. There's another one that we recently added in, from, uh, which is the, Bar the Belhar Confession. Barman, Belhar, I get those two confused. Anyways, the um, Belhar Confession comes out of apartheid South Africa. And that one basically says racism is bad. And so we're adding to this book all the time, and we actually just commissioned a new statement of belief that gets included in this book soon to be, but I just wanna make clear, John Calvin isn't in here. We don't like him. I don't know a single Presbyterian that I've met that likes Tulip or any of those teachings. If you want those people, go to the Reformed Church in America. They're the ones that hang on to him. It's not us. Because <laughs> frankly, he was, most words I use for him are not church appropriate. <laughs> so we're in agreement there. So that's one thing I wanted to put out there. We don't like him. So I'm going to turn back to you. And what's the misconception you want to dis uh, dispel? <sighs> well, <laughs> all of them. Um, I think the thing that most impacts my ministry right now is this idea that um, you can never be wrong as a Unitarian Universalist, and that this is a never-ending source of affirmation for people. Um, you know, somewhere in the mid-20th century, prayers of confession fell out of Unitarian <laughs> hymn books. <laughs> I don't know that that was for the best, um, because we're not meant to be a serotonin dispenser, and, and I think that there's a misconception that you, your church should always make you feel good. And there's a difference between, now we all know that we're in a, except for Welcome visitors, we're in a time of transition <laughs> uh, where we are moving away from principle language into values language. And that doesn't mean principles will disappear, but I just kind of want to like name that that is happening so everyone can just know that. But um, saying that people have inherent worth and dignity is not the same thing as saying that people are good. Worth and dignity are different from good and bad and was a, was a way of sort of stepping to the side of the conversation of are people inherently good or bad. People are inherently worthy and have dignity. Behaviors don't, right? People have worth and dignity, behaviors do not. And it is not a no holds barred atmosphere in UU congregations. And that's true theologically as, as well. I think people tend to use the phrase cafeteria uh, a lot for Unitarian Universalism. I think that's also a fallacy that we need to move away from. It's not really so much of a cafeteria where you just pick what you like. It's really more a plate that an ancestor lovingly prepared for you that definitely has some greens on it that you don't maybe want, but you need <laughs> to be healthy, right? <laughs> and you have to eat a little bit of all of it <laughs> in order to have a balanced diet. Because <laughs> um, if you let me just hang out at the, you know, at the cafeteria, it's just gonna be jello and fried catfish. And that's not a way a person can live, right? Are you saying you need collard greens in there? I am. <laughs> and play to my southern roots. Uh, in my family, it was, uh, it was turnip greens, but yeah. <laughs> I am. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, 
Pastor Chris, what are some of the formative experiences with the church as an institution that informs your ministry? We've had um, similar but really different paths that we wanted to be able to talk yeah. about a little bit. So um, the thing to start off with when it comes to like my journey in the church, you have to understand I was a strange child. I know. It's one of those things. I don't say this as like, oh, I wasn't the popular kid. Like truly, I was strange and I knew it and I didn't have many friends. Um, and it, the thing is, I enjoyed it, so like I knew I was strange. Anyways, that's a whole other conversation. But what I found was my youth group was the first group that ever said, we like you not despite your strangeness, but because of it. That we like you as you are with everything that you're bringing to the table. And that level of acceptance and love and just affirmation of who I was, was groundbreaking. And I've been chasing that feeling ever since. And, but the reality is not every church group is like that. And so my world was rocked with, in college when I joined a Bible study because I wanted something to do on campus. And they, the, there was a group that had a really good Bible study, but they were also a group that very much wanted you to fit a certain shape. And so it was a, everyone is welcomed because we want a project to work on. And th all of a sudden, or I remember my freshman year, it was they were choosing leadership for the next year. And there was eight of us, and they chose seven leaders. <laughs> and it became very clear very quickly that I was too big, too much, too extra, too loud, too, I'm not going to sit and take your directions. No, thank you. I disagree. And that wasn't going to work. And all of a sudden, I found that the place where I thought was home the place where I thought I was going to get loved and accepted was telling me I am doing everything wrong. The actual thing said around campus to me was I was dragging people down to hell. <laughs> <laughs> I know! <laughs> and I was just flabbergasted. Um, but the thing was, they weren't Presbyterians. Now, me and I am not die-hard Presbyterian. I actually grew up Disciples of Christ. I fell into the Presbyterian denomination. But what I realized is everything they thought was wrong with me was actually okay, if not good, in the tradition I came from. And so I like had a weird journey. I actually tried to leave Christianity for a while. I wanted to be any other religion. I was of the opinion, if this is what Christianity is, I want no part of it. But I joined an interfaith group was the thing that pivoted me, actually, because I was in the interfaith group, almost shopping of like, tell me your beliefs because I'm looking for somewhere to jump ship to. And I realized in those conversations that, yes, these are beautiful traditions and I love them so much. I say I have religion crushes all the time. <laughs> but I realized that I still had something to say about my tradition. I wasn't actually happy with any of theirs because I still liked mine. I just l was letting someone else speak for me. And I realized if, if I left, then they actually do get to say what the tradition's about. And so that is why even though like we're actually theologically fairly similar, um, more than either of our traditions would probably want us to be, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the thing about it is I realized I had something to say and I wanted to speak louder than those people that were spewing very hateful messages on my behalf. And so I ended up coming back to the Presbyterian tradition, not because I agree with it 100%, but because I wanted to make it better, because I wanted to speak louder, because I wanted to be a voice of that inclusion that I felt as a kid. So... Now, you have a different trajectory, also related to Presbyterianism. Yeah, so I grew up hardcore Presbyterian, fifth generation. My grandmother very much loved John Calvin. Okay, did they teach Tulip? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, oh, maybe this is a Tulip recent Church. development that we don't like it. It could be a, could be a Texas thing. But um, so, I, yeah, I grew up in a house where we had the Bible, a dictionary, the Book of Confessions, and Robert's Rules of Order. Like, right in a row, because we were that Presbyterian. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think, you know, maybe I default to a little process-heavy for this congregation sometimes, but that's why. 
Um, so what happened to me was I was edged out of my church after I uh, became very obviously queer. It doesn't matter if I wear a dress. It's still this, right? <laughs> so when I was like 16 or 17, it was, uh, there was no more hiding that. Um, my youth group was very supportive. There were many people in the church who were very supportive. Uh, they were all told to leave. My youth director was fired for um, being too liberal on queer issues. And um, it was really rough. And I gave a sermon about this um, about a year ago. And then I was like, for like a week, had a trauma hangover. So I'm not going to get into it again today. But it was hard and it was bad. And I uh, wound up uh, not sure what to do. I did go to UU churches a little bit when I was in college. Um, and then I started working in a UU church when I was in graduate school because I needed a job on a Sunday because I wasn't working then and I had a lot of experience working in churches. Uh, and then, you know, it was like, oh my God, why am I making everything hard? Like, obviously this is where I need to be. So <laughs> um, that is when my, my journey with Unitarian Universalism began in, in earnest. Um, I was always really clear that the fight for the ordination of LGBTQ folks, well, it was the 90s, so just L and G folks, because uh, <laughs> it was the 90s, um, that it wasn't, it wasn't my fight. And I don't know why. And I was mad that it wasn't my fight, but it wasn't. And it never felt right for me. And I got really involved in various ordination causes and um, tried to, to do that work in the Presbyterian Church, but it never felt, it never felt right, you know. Um, so I, you know, I did check out some of those uh, 1990s finger painting, wine drinking, nighttime churches um, to try to, you know, like do something cool and hip, you know, <laughs> those emergent churches, and they were gnarly. They were rotten to the core. Their theology was 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 just rotten, um, and it was a lie, right? And I, I'm very sensitive to things that are lies. I'm not interested, right? Integrity is like the number one on on my list. Uh, so I just felt like, here's the thing. I don't need anybody to tell me what God is telling me to do in my life, ever. And that's why Unitarian Universalism is the, is the place for me to be. Because we're non-creedal, we're non-doctrinal, we have the freedom to move as we are called by the Spirit. And I know that language doesn't work for everybody, but there, there are cognates that will work for you. Like, you have your own right to conscience, and therefore you should be able to decide what is true and right for you. And, and I affirm that, and I think that that path is, is just as valid um, as any other path. But yeah, I, I just um, think that God doesn't fit into institutions <laughs> real well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just, I feel like institutions wind up recreating human oppressions over and over and over again. I'm sorry, Reverend Julie, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I think we have to constantly do work to, to not edge out the spirit in institutions. And, I, and that includes churches, our institutions, right? All of them. So my experiences have made me both very interested in inclusive practices and also very sensitive to how power and oppression plays out in groups of people. And we have to constantly be on the lookout for that. And we need each other. This is why we need churches and communities. So we need each other to point out when we have fallen short on, on something and when we have recreated that system of power and oppression. We need those, those various perspectives to help us recognize and then root that, root that out. Can I jump in real quick? I, I feel like this is also the benefit of having institutions friends with other institutions is because I, like anything, my, one of my personal theologies is like anything humans make is going to be flawed because humans are flawed and it just happens. We have shortcomings. This is a very Presbyterian sense of me. But one of the things is when you partner with another institution that may have a different set of flaws than your own institution, you get to mutually strengthen each other. Because like, I love actually the ways that your all's tradi tradition challenges mine. Because it needs to be. And then sometimes you, uh, like the challenge comes from somewhere else. And kind of like how friends iron sharpens iron, sometimes we need institutions to be friends with each other to point out the blind spots that we have in our own. So, which is why I'm happy to be sitting here. Yeah. Hey. Maybe why we're doing this. <laughs> because nobody but nobody makes it out here alone. Mm -hmm. Hey, speaking of which, um, yeah. what would you say are the greatest challenges facing your congregation today? My, uh, uh, 
Sure. I, this is actually, this is probably my biggest soapbox. I spent one summer, the whole summer talking about this. So um, if you know where summer, I, if you don't know where Northminster is, go down Big Beaver and stop before you get to Somerset Mall. Um, we are tiny. And if you would listen to my congregation, the thing that they think is the biggest threat, the biggest challenge facing them is congregational decline. So we're about 30 or 40 active members, depending whether it's summer or fall. Um, we have been going up and down around a, def a budget deficit, wondering if we're gonna have, for, for the last four years, they've been saying we have three years of money left in the bank. We have no endowment. The, we need to find a way to not constantly be in a threat of a budget deficit, and they think the way to do that is more butts and seats. And so they're looking at it saying, there's, no, there's not many people my age in the church. There's not really people younger than me. Um, we had our last confirmation class and we have no more kids. They're scared about people. And that is not what I'm looking at. What I see is that, yes, the church is in decline. Uh, religion in our country is currently in decline. It's just, but it's not even the past five years. It's not since COVID. It's not even the last decade. This is a decades long thing that's been going on. We're just only noticing now. And the thing is, congregations will always outlast pastors. Pastors only stick around for a portion of a church's life. They are always going to go somewhere else eventually, even like our Northminster's founding pastors. pastor is Mac Taylor. He was there for 37 years, but the congregation keeps going without him. That's the beauty of these things is you have the tradition, which means if things have been in decline, it's not necessarily the pastor. It's the habits of decline that develop in congregations. And so I start looking at what habits have you gotten into that have got us to this space? What habits have made it so your, your congregation shot up at one point and then started that slow decline? What was it that happened? What changed? Some of it's population, some of it's demographic, but some of it is like, are like how are you reaching out are you opening the doors what happens if you're opening the doors wide open but people stopped knocking and there's a lot going on and so the thing that i find the biggest challenge is changing the habits of decline because the habits have been going on for decades and the climb out of that is also decades long so you have to be in it for the long haul and it's a lot of habit changing so that is my soapbox. I am now gonna pass the soapbox over here. Do you have a? No, I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I really wasn't expecting, that was amazing, thank you. Uh, sometimes I just feel like we're living the same life and that's because churches in 2023 in this, in this area, we are facing the same, the same issues. So I think that in our congregation, it might seem like it's money. We also have had a deficit issue since I've been here at least. Uh, people might think it's, it's membership. There have been a couple spicy emails that went out over the weekend, so if you got one of those, <laughs> yes, we've had a decline in membership. Um, I think also the challenges of maintaining a Yamasaki building. Oh, goodness. <laughs> but we love him here, be careful. <laughs> we both have Yamasaki buildings. With Yours is, is, I will comfort you all by saying your Yamasaki is in much better shape. Oh. <laughs> well done. <laughs> It's, it's a challenge to maintain uh, this, this building, um, but I don't think that's it. I don't think it's any of those things. I think it's actually at its root, anxiety. I think it's anxiety. Because the, the, the symptoms of anxiety are, are present in our congregation. One of the main ones is scapegoating. As much as I like goats, y'all, I am not the reason that these things are happening. Um, also, the, the fear with which people approach these issues, um, it's true that these are challenges that need to be addressed, but nobody makes good decisions when they're anxious. And, you know, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but so you, yeah. you're Presbyterian, so they made you learn Greek, right? Yes. Okay. So the, did they tell you 
because I didn't, I went to a school where we drew ham turkeys. But let's say that the, uh, <laughs> we learned how to be ministers, not theologians. But um, <laughs> we'll say that the, uh, they told us that the, uh, the Greek root of the word anxiety is oh. strangulation. Right? Did you learn that? Strangulation? I would need to pull up my Bible software that has translations at right. the bottom of it. I, That's I what they said, and I believe it to be true. Okay. Because when you think about the experience of anxiety, we feel it in here, right? Nobody makes good decisions when they feel like they don't have options. Nobody makes good decisions when they feel afraid. Nobody makes good decisions when they feel a time pressure. It's true that we have some serious challenges we need to face, but we cannot be creative and we cannot be collaborative if we're approaching everything from a scarcity anxious paradox. We have to partner with each other and collaborate as a congregation, with staff team, with other congregations, me, to figure out how we want to approach these problems. We're not going to find the solution to the decline of religion in America. Um, although I think there is some space there for you to use to get out of our way, but <laughs> that's another sermon. <laughs> We're not going to find the one and only best right solution. There is no silver bullet, but there are choices. And if we want to take a thoughtful, creative approach to finding the choice that we feel best about, we're gonna have to take it down a notch and be able to breathe and to speak to each other with ease and comfort to come to those solutions together. Uh, <laughs> so we, then we wanted to talk about ministry trajectories. I think I'd like to go first on this one. <laughs> go for it. Listen, I know that there are some of y'all that if I left tomorrow, you would have a party. I know that. And I'm not. <laughs> I'm all in. I love this church, and I love the people here, even the ones who want to have a party if I leave. <laughs> there is so much opportunity here. There is so much potential in this congregation. There are some things that have happened in my family that should give you some insurance. I'm not planning on going anywhere. We have an infant, right? We're not planning on going anywhere anytime soon, but more importantly, I'm incredibly stubborn, and when somebody is mean to me, it tacks on two more years for how long I'm gonna be here. So if you don't want me to be here forever. No, but in all seriousness, though, I, I think that I have um, a perspective on Unitarian Universalism, and I think I have a skill set that this congregation could really benefit from, and I think we could do some really good work together, and I, I'm in it to win it, and I hope that we'll have a long time together. So when I first started seminary, one of the questions I got a lot was, why are you tying yourself to a sinking ship? <laughs> you are young, you are like, you are a baby, why are you going into a dying institution. And uh, so fair warning, I am gonna pull out a little Christian theology for this. Um, I find it to have helpful metaphors. And one of my things again and again that I tell my own people is, we cannot kill the church. We are not strong enough to do that. That this version of the church might die, but we cannot kill the church in general. We're just not good enough to do that. Um, and so with that in mind, it's almost, it's not about whether or not I'm gonna like go down with the ship tied to the mast, but what are you gonna do with the time you have? And kind of like you with Northminster, like I'm with them for the long haul. Um, and it's something I've told them again and again because there is that anxiety and they know that I can get a better paying job elsewhere. I've told them, no, I. Like, I am here because there is something special here that I think you have something to say. So the way I approached it with them, knowing that we have de decline in the church, knowing that we are, I mean, last year was the first year we balanced the budget in a while. And um, yeah, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but, but the thing that I told them is like, okay, so we have, you've been telling me for three years that we have three years of money in the bank. What would we do if we went all in and did three years of amazing ministry? 
You did everything you wanted to do. If you just spent the money and did it, instead of holding back, worrying, and wondering, is it gonna last? What are we gonna do? What happens if the roof falls? What if you didn't care and you just did it? Because Jesus only had three years and he made a very big impact on the world. <laughs> and so three years can be life-changing. So what would we think about doing if we didn't want to last forever? And that's actually when a lot of ideas started coming forth because all of a sudden, lasting another 50, 60, 70 years, that's off the table. We're not shooting for that anymore. We're shooting for amazing ministry where we are. And when we're done, we're done. Good and faithful servant, well done. And so that is the perspective that we're going with now is what would we do if we weren't afraid? And the other side of that is having to change, one of the big habits we're trying to change is somewhere since like the, I think it's the late 70s, we stopped being invitational is what I say. Invitation, I don't like the word evangelical, that's a lot where those scars are. So I needed a word that wasn't evangelical to mean, what do we do if we don't assume people are gonna come? because that's one of the biggest demographic changes is that people are not expected to be religious. On my way to church, I pass by the Whistle Stop Cafe and trust me, there is more people waiting in line to go to brunch than there will be in my sanctuary, which means that that is a holier place for them to be. So what are we doing that has something to offer them? Because they now, church is not the norm. Mo we're heading to a demographic change where we have to have something to offer. And so thinking about what do we do if we are no longer entitled to people's time and attention? We are not entitled to people coming. It's not which religious church am I going to, it's do I want to or not? And so where my career is going is like, how do we become invitational? How do we do something big how do we not worry about the far future, but worry about where people are struggling now? What can we offer people that people need, that they can't just get on the soccer field, that they can't get at brunch? What, is, what are we actually bringing to the table? Um, and figuring out with that with our community, that's all my questions is like, what, what are people needing that we can offer that we can have basically the corner on the market. Because if you want a sermon, you can go on YouTube. There's preachers better than me on there. No. I'm good, but I'm, I'm not as flashy as some of those people. So it's one of those. It's kind of asking the thing of what do we need to be today? Not what, where we were, what do we need to be today? Addressing the problems that people are dealing with today and not trying to last forever just trying to be here now. Yeah, there was, a, there was a book that got really popular a few years ago called After the Good News by Nancy McDonald Ladd. And one of the things that she says in, in that book is uh, we cannot be the church of the future by being the very best church of the mid 20th century. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, so you know, looking at why are we doing things? Mm -hmm. Is it because we think we're supposed to do them? Are we doing it out of habit? Or are we doing it because it has meaning and value? Does it bring joy? How does it speak to the issues of, of today? And I'm a traditionalist and I, I love high church and an institutionalist despite what I said earlier about God and institutions. Uh, but <laughs> it's true. Um, but those things don't always, how do we breathe new life into forms or know when it's time to let go of forms? We had to pull on that. Mm -hmm. That, that Emerson power of does it make sense to continue serving communion in his case, and in our case, does it make sense to continue fill in the blank? So many questions. We, we have a, we have a go-to phrase in my tradition, we are reformed and always reforming, mm -hmm. which means we're, we changed to get here, which means we're gonna keep changing. And the question is, when are you throwing the bathwater out and when are you throwing the baby too? Um, and I think that is when community is key, and that's one of the strengths. I, I will defend institutions, because if you don't have institutions, you gotta basically be willing for something to fizzle out eventually. 
Um, that's what the history of the church shows, that when new communities pop up all the time, and the ones that last more than about 70, 80, 100 years are the ones that build an institution around it, for better or for worse. We, it's helpful for us. But then the question is, what gets saved and what gets tossed? And we do that in community and discussion and challenging each other. Um, if it's just one person's opinion of what gets tossed, that's called, that's called a cult. Yep. <laughs> we know we're not. <laughs> because cults are organized. Um, uh, so. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I would say that, that that's a big part of Presbyterianism that influences my theology, my Unitarian Universalism, is uh, Reformation education and hospitality are the like underlying points of Presbyterianism that feel very important to me still, right? And if we're talking about what makes sense to keep and what makes sense to throw out, I think those, those three things are um, something we, we need to consider how we are bringing them alive in our, in our context. Absolutely. Well, I think we're just out of time. We have a little closing remark you'd like to make? Uh, we have to sing a song and you have to say the benediction. Okay. Wait, four minutes. <laughs> I, I, I've talked a lot. I am a chatty one. So I am, if you all want to talk, uh, I, I love discussion. Uh, um, see me afterwards if you have questions or if you want to pick my brain or challenge me. I'm, I'm good for it all. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming of today. Of course. It was a pleasure. Would you please stand and join me in singing hymn number 12, O Life That Maketh All Things New. Thank you.